We can consider here an interesting case where we have two masses that are hanging from the ceiling or some other upper structure and it's being held up by a couple of wires or ropes or strings, something there that's basically keeping that in place. And we're curious then, okay, how could we figure out then if, for example, one of these wires would break on you? We might have the problem that, oh, if there is too much force on a wire or a rope, it will eventually snap on you. So we need to figure out, okay, how do we even figure out how much force or how much can any sort of thing handle? We need to then basically start talking about tension in wires or in ropes and how large is that tension force. We could then do some material science and figure out what tension will finally snap it. But in general, how do we figure out how much tension there is in some given physical situation? So in this case, I can complicate it also by having not just one body, but multiple bodies, and have, in this case, different tensions here. So we'll give things a little bit of a label here. So we'll call this wire 1 and wire 2. That way we can distinguish them, and we don't have to necessarily say the same tensions are involved. But what if then we really want to figure out, okay, what is the tension in each of these wires? So it's probably too complicated looking at everything here together, so let's actually look at each block individually. We could look at also at the wires individually, but it's much easier to just work with the blocks. So let's look at, for example, block one, and consider the forces acting on block one. Well, it definitely is going to have its own weight downward. That's a given, as long as we're doing this on a planet with some gravity, and you probably would in your life. On the other hand, of course, we expect there should be a tension force upward. The wire is holding this thing up. On the other hand, of course, mass 1 is also attached to mass 2 by a wire, so that's also kind of pulling it down. So we'd also expect there to be tension 2 acting on block 1. So if I were to set up Newton's second law here for this block, I would have two tension forces. That's two unknowns with one equation. I probably won't get very far starting there. But we'll, here's our setup, and we can approach this maybe in a little bit. Let's also set up a free body diagram for block 2. Again, we have its own weight pulling it down. And in this case, there's only one wire acting on it, wire 2, so there's tension 2 upward. And also, do mind the labeling I have. So this tension 2 and this tension 2 are the same magnitude, even though they're pointing in different directions. But nonetheless, the same magnitude, so this will be useful. Now, if we just have the simple case here, of this being static, of everything just hanging out here, then we know there should be overall no acceleration in the y direction or even in the x direction we'd expect as well. So we know that the forces need to balance out, which will be extremely helpful. So I had mentioned that if we try using Newton's second law on this block immediately, we'll have two unknowns in it, tension 1 and tension 2. So let's might be a little bit too hard to then figure things out. Let's start with this block where it's as simple as can be. So let's do the sum of the forces on block 2 in the y direction. In this case, we're going to say that positive y is up, and the x direction, there's nothing going on there, so we'll just ignore that for now since there's nothing to play with. So with this setup, Tension 2 is in the positive direction. Weight is downward, so in the negative direction. And again, since this is not accelerating, the forces balance out. Some of the forces should be 0. Aha! So with one step of algebra, I see that tension 2 is just the weight of that block. Not too bad, not too bad. 
Let's give ourselves a little bit of space now. We'll set that result over here. And we can do the same thing then to talk about the sum of the forces on block one in the y direction. So in that case, we have tension one up, tension two downward acting on that block, and the weight of that block. And again, we're talking a static case, so this should just be summing up to zero again. So I can solve for T1 with just a little bit of algebra, and I see that T1 is equal to tension 2 plus M1G. We already solved for tension 2. I can plug that in, and so I actually see that with a little distributive property, I can write this like so. And if you were to first guess what the tension should be, it kind of makes sense that tension 1 is effectively holding up both blocks. And that's exactly what we see here, that tension 1 is holding up both masses here, the weight of those two masses connected together. Not too bad overall. That's not too difficult. And this, of course, was for a static case. All right, then what if we wanted to complicate things a little bit? In this scenario, instead of hanging the masses up, I'm going to hold them and not only I'm going to hold them in place, but I'm going to lift up all these masses and accelerate them upward. So I'm working my muscles, and let's say I give an acceleration to this system of one meter per second squared. So the blocks are going to move up, and they're going to accelerate upward for whatever period of time. So at this instant, we can look at the tension here. We still ultimately have the same free body diagrams. The exact same forces are acting on the blocks. So for block two, there's only two forces. It's weight and it's tension. On block one, there's only three forces, tension up, tension down, and its own weight. It's the exact same sorts of things, but now there's acceleration involved. So let's take a look at that scenario. So let's again do sum of the forces on block two in the y direction. And again, we'll still say that up is positive y, and I'm accelerating upwards, so it's a positive acceleration. So in this case, we still have tension 2 upward, the weight of block 2 downward, and in this case, from Newton's second law, the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. Nonetheless, though, I can still do the same sort of algebra and solve for T2 algebraically. And I can also do a little distributive property and make this a little bit cleaner. So I would have G plus A times M2, just to make it look a little cleaner. All right, and I can also set up some of the forces on 1 in the y direction. We'll have tension 1 up using the same notation I had before. Tension 2 down, weight of mass 1 down equals that mass times acceleration. And notice the labeling I have chosen. Mass 1, mass 2, some of the forces on 2, some of the forces on 1. One thing you definitely want to be careful, don't just write mass here. You want to specify which mass you're dealing with. You're doing the sum of the forces on body 2. You need then the mass of body 2, just for clarity. OK, so again, let's just solve for T1 algebraically. And we see that would just be T2 plus and I'll do the same sort of distributive stuff I did earlier, where I have G plus A M1. Okay, and you'd see that I could also then plug in what I had for T2 here, doing that. And what I will find is I can do a lot more of the same sort of distributive stuff here. Make it clear so I will have G plus A M2 plus G plus A M1. So again, I could do distributive property things and find G plus A times M1 plus M2. So again, what would this imply? Oh, well, that the tension here 
has to again lift both masses and so it basically has to be strong enough to hold up the weight of those two masses, the g term, the weight term then, and then how much it needs to be accelerated. And from either setup, what you would expect is that this wire is under more tension than this wire. We see that T2 is just M2 times g plus a, but for tension 1, it has to it has both mass terms, so it's always going to be larger. So, if you were to accelerate this thing, if you were to expect either of these wires to break, you would think the first one would break before the second one, since the first one's holding up with a lot more tension. So, we had done everything algebraically, but let's plug in some numbers just to make things absolutely concrete. Let's say that mass 1 is just 1 kilogram. Mass 2, on the other hand, we'll say is 5 kilograms, just to have some numbers. And we'll keep the same acceleration. We'll assume this is on Earth, so the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. And so if we do that, we're going to find then that tension 1 is going to be 9.8 plus 1 times mass 1, 1 plus mass 2, 5. So this is 10.8 times 6, which equals 64.8 newtons. And tension 2, just plugging in our numbers is again, 9.8 1, and then just the mass of 2, which is 5, so we have 10.8 times 5, and that equals 54.0 newtons. So here a clear case then where tension 1 is greater than tension 2 and should always be unless somehow you find some negative mass blocks, which I will tell you are very, very hard to find, and if you do, there is a Nobel Prize waiting for you. So, for procedure, the way you find the tension force is, in many ways, much like you do for finding the normal force. You set up your free body diagram, and then use Newton's second law to do the sum of the forces equaling the mass times acceleration of the body in the direction the tensions are pointing. It could be a static case, in which case there's no acceleration, or it could be someone lifting up the whole system and accelerating it. One way or another, you're still ultimately doing the same sorts of setups using free body diagrams, Newton's second law, and then some algebra.